Awesome. Thanks so much, Ken. Um, really appreciate it. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. And yeah, it's uh, there's something really good in the works. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I'm going to try to, but I just realized it's November now. I'm working on uh, the freshwater fishes of BC, and I'm going to try to get a field identification guide by hopefully this time next year. So it's it's quite the, the endeavor to get it done, but uh, I have a lot of great people helping me out and gonna hopefully next summer, depending on how COVID goes, get some samples and get some photos and uh, just see how um, BC is gonna treat everything. And yeah, it's, uh, it's really nice to get back into presenting and um, even if it's through Zoom, it's nice to see everybody, nice to connect. So this is a, it's a really great way. Um, just want to say thank you so much for having me as a guest speaker because I was just thinking back to um, the first time I presented for your group was back in 2010 with Jessica Riley and we're just getting fish identification kind of going and out there and uh, yeah and then I came back in 2017 which is a lot of fun and uh, back now and I love teaching you guys you guys are just uh, everybody's so much fun and it'll be a little bit short um, but I hope everybody likes it and uh, I'm gonna dive right on into it here. Okay, oh, perfect. I wasn't sure about uh, if everything was gonna work or not. Um, right away, the first question I think I like to ask people is, cause I love small body fish and typically they're called bait fish. And there's so many reasons why, and Ken alluded to this a little bit before we started. And I wanted to give a big shout out to Peter and all of you volunteering at the Northern Lights Fly Fishers because the signs that they made, what trout eat, they are fantastic. And as you can see here, this is just a little bit of a sample of uh, the blue links will actually go to talk about the different fish species and a little bit about a D, but a lot of the history to it. And there's so many great links and it's such a good project that uh, I got to help out and just uh, do some edits and reviews. And I just want to say for a volunteer group, well done, very great. Um, we involved a lot of different people. So these are available at uh, just at the link here. And um, if you go onto the website too, that you could go see the digital form, which is fantastic. Um, and there's also Mirror Lake education signs that were put up in September 20, 2021. And I had the chance to go out and look at them and they're fantastic. Um, but of course, I just wanted to highlight the one I helped out with. Um, it was such a good way to, put the small fish into the trout species and into sport fish because a lot of people look at the sport fish and think you know this is where this is where the whole fishery is but there's there's so much more to it and so when you get into the minnows and the sticklebacks and all the other small body fish that we're going to talk about here soon they're they're mimicking something and those trout species and the sport fish are going to eat those species so it's that trophic food level that you got to start with the small ones but the small ones are super important so and uh, you can mimic them with flies, with different fishing lures. So it's uh, when you have a chance, definitely check it out. And there's even a little scan bar and just excellent job on this and such a great resource. So I was really, really happy to be a part of this. Okay, so let's dive right into it. Um, what do we really know, need to know to start Fish ID? Well, a lot of you know your sport fresh already. So we're gonna skip right into the minnow section because this is the part I love the most because when I started my career, what is that fish? I don't know. You know what? Uh, we're just, it's, they're all leech of, it's fine. But you know what? Every fish has a name. They get classified, they get families. And so I just like to have a, just a respectful attitude to a fish isn't just a fish. There's, there's a meaning for every fish that are here. So it's always fun to try to figure out what they are and identify them. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a key. I'm not going to go too much into the key, but I'll give you an idea of um, the guides that uh, Ken alluded to too. Um, we're going to look at distribution. And these are the guides that uh, I prepared. I think I started Fishes in Alberta, if I could remember correctly, back in 2006 when I was a fisheries technician at Golder Associates. And honestly, when I started my career, I didn't want to touch a fish. I wouldn't look at a fish. So the fact that 16, about 16 years later, this is where I kind of become and uh, wrote another book for Fish is the Sketch one, because I, I saw the need of, it's really hard to figure out your small fish, especially in different provinces. And there's so many, and just in Alberta, there's 65 different fish species. So I thought, I'm just gonna take a bunch of pictures and put it into a book. So it's a, uh, it works out really good. Um, yeah. and. Basically, this is kind of where 
it really led me to understand when you look at fish, they have to be in a little aquarium, especially these little small body fish, because, well, for Eve, it's an ethical way of doing it, but I'm going to look at different um, identification features. So when I say dorsal origin, it's talking about the dorsal, this dorsal fin, and it's going to be the right, the beginning of the, the dorsal fin there. Pelvic origin is going to be the beginning of the pelvic fin here. And sometimes I'll be looking for, is there an adipose fin? So those are really good features we're going to use. And um, a lot of the times we're going to be looking at the head shape and the scale shape, and there's going to be so many different features I'm going to throw at you. But the point is that, you know, if you could get two to three characteristics versus one, that's usually what I look for when we come to fish ID. Um, and then we'll just get through some of these. Um, so quite a while back, I had a little bit of feedback on the book, which has been fantastic. I've had so many people look at it and critique it and edit it. And I'm going to call out uh, Lila, Alicia and Holly for that too. Really do appreciate it because there are certain things that I might miss as well. And when we look at this, it sometimes looks a little bit overwhelming, but I try to make it easy, but I split it up into this is small body minnows. So this is just one key out of four. I have ones for sport fish and a few other fish as well too. I adapted this from the great book, The Fish is Alberta by Nelson Pates. This one is a fantastic one I've learned off as well. I did find it was hard because there wasn't a lot of pictures, but um, for me, a picture is definitely a thousand, thousand words because it's really easy to spot some of those features when they're live fish. And so a lot of times I'll, I'll talk about, okay, small body of minnows, less than 15 centimeters. But we also got to be careful too, is sometimes people think trout are minnows. So um, a lot of times I'll go into scales are visible versus not, not non-visible. So you can see here, they're not really noticeable as they are here. And then we talk about dorsal fin origin. Maybe there's a large anal fin, um, sometimes a pointed dorsal, no spot. And then it leads into a whole different variety of fish that a lot of people may not know about. Honestly, I might have misidentified a river shiner quite a few different times in my career. So this has really helped me develop as I was in the field for quite a few years and caught a lot of different fish. And just basically adapted it to what's the best way to educate myself and educate others because those little small body fish, they need some respect too, right? <laughs> okay, and distribution is an excellent ID feature to use and it should always be considered. So when we go throughout the presentation, these are basically the slides from my guide that I created with uh, when I went back to school, made these fancy GIS maps and stuff. And they're just basically broken down into drainage basins within Alberta. Um, you could always refer back to this page in the book, but it just kind of shows me uh, drainage basins in certain areas. But if this whole map is colored, basically that means the fish is there. If there's parts that aren't showing and there's no number, it means the fish generally isn't there. And I'm going to go basically on general watersheds because they're not necessarily found in the whole system. And I've talked to some of the fisheries biologists and they said, you know what, don't pinpoint certain locations, just pinpoint general watersheds. And sometimes we don't actually have enough information on these minnows to pinpoint, are they really here? Because we don't have enough um, peer published education on them because a lot of people don't really foresee the bait fish being um, one of the top things that we should actually look at. But in essence, if your bait fish disappear out of the system, it's really going to wreak havoc on your sport fisheries. So you kind of have to balance the two to go together with it. And I think that's why I appreciate them so much is everything has a balance in our, in our, in our systems. Okay. These guys, so this is part of the, per, per, oh my goodness, I'm not good at scientific names, Percopsidae, Percidae, Percidae. <laughs> so these are just small body perch and darters. Um, because we don't have a lot of time and we're, we're I'm going to try to keep it around half an hour so we can have questions. I only pinpointed probably my favorite type of minnows and some that are really get mixed up throughout. So um, by all means, capture me after. Maybe once COVID slows down and we're back in person, I'm gonna start my fish ID sessions again too. And I'll, I'll make sure um, whoever's interested, we could get a hands-on, you could touch samples, we could look at them and uh, kind of go from there. 
But with the Iowa darter, this one is one of my favorites is because in their spawning colors, the males have these beautiful colored fins. They have little striations. These ones, the Iowa darter are part of the perch family. So they basically have the soft second fin ray and the spiny first fin ray. And you can see here, we've got this nice suborbital band right below the eye. Um, females don't get as colorful, but you can see some colors here. And these are some great pictures that Trina, one of my dive buddies, has been taking. And I've been soliciting photos from them. So I've got a lot of divers taking some natural underwater photos, which is amazing. And here's another reason why it's nice to have them in the container, because then their fins are going to be up and you can see what's going on in here. But as you can see here, the distribution is typically not northern Alberta. So they're not going to be in this vicinity. They're going to be in a lot of different watersheds throughout. Most of the time I will find them in the lakes, not so much rivers. So that'd be a good one to pinpoint if you're fishing for um, sport fish in the rivers. I don't usually capture them. Doesn't mean they're not there, but most of the time I've caught, captured them in um, Wobman Lakes is a good one that uh, I know I've caught a, quite a few there. The other thing we're gonna look for is these dark vertical bars that a lot of times we'll call paw marks, but they're not exactly paw marks. They're more just dark vertical bars along the body. The other one that's key feature to this one is the log perch. It's slightly different, but it doesn't have the bars as much as it does here. Um, yeah, okay. So this is the one I was trying to actually say earlier, Percopsidae. So these are the trout perches. I'm not sure how many times or how many people know about trout perch, but these are special because they get their own personal family. So basically they have trout characteristics and perch characteristics, which is pretty amazing if you ask me. And love these guys because these ones are actually a little bit translucent on the body here. They tend to be not over 10 centimeters. If you, what I call granddaddy ones is if they're about 120 centimeters. You can see here, they're distributed basically all over Alberta. A lot of times I've caught them in North Saskatchewan River in the vegetated areas, both of the low flow areas. Um, haven't really caught them too much in the, in the lakes, but while I love these ones, they just, they just eat them up and they get really fat when they, when they capture these. So these ones, so when I was talking about, there's some spots along the body, but these ones have an adipose fin. So the other only ones that have an adipose fin are the Slimolinde family. So that's part of their trope characteristics. But then the perch characteristics actually comes from what they have called the satinoid scales. So it's a cyanide scales is a little bristles and they're circular, almost look like a little bit of a Bart Simpson scale. So when you rub the body of them, they actually feel rough, which is neat because then it's that perch characteristic, but then the trout characteristic of the adipose fin. And I think from the lineage that I read was one dorsal fin turned into um, the adipose fin and that's where they kind of lost their perch characteristic which is really kind of neat when you think of the lineage of these guys. Um, but these ones are really like, these ones are a lot of fun to catch. Um, we've used them for mark recapture stuff and they're really, uh, really kind of neat fish. Okay. And I know there's a lot of people that uh, have may have caught the sticklebacks and the sticklebacks are honestly in every pretty much water body that potentially has fish because they're such amazing species. And why are they amazing species? Honestly, they can handle 0.5 milligrams per liter, whereas trout need at least over six milligrams per liter dissolved oxygen. Uh, it's pretty amazing what they can handle and they could be in a little pond, a little ditch and on the side of, on a pipeline where basically the thrasher has gone over it and I poke a hole, so there's some ice and oh no, there's a bunch of stickle back down there. So. They're pretty, pretty amazing hardy species. And it's one of the species you'll pretty much find everywhere. So if you could make a fly that imitates these ones, mm, that's, that's a really good way. Um, what we're looking for in these guys, you can see these sticks along the back and typically Brooks stickleback will have five spines. Sometimes one will get snapped off or they'll have a few more, but usually no more than, no less than four, no more than seven. Usually when I've saw them, they're about five. Um, the really neat thing is about stickleback too, is they have their surface feeders. So I've never caught one on the fly, but I have caught other fish on the fly that are surface feeders. So that's a lot of fun. And another cool feature of these ones, they build nests on the algae and leaves and they 
sorry, excrete from their kidneys. So basically the males will actually build the nest and they'll take care of the family and the female go off and lay eggs with another female, another male, which is kind of neat. So it's a parental care of the male that takes care of everything on here. And as you see here, distribution pretty much all over Alberta, anywhere you can find them there. They're basically gonna be there. Okay, and we're gonna compare it to the nine spine. So this one's really neat. So this one, as you can see, it doesn't it sometimes won't have those nine spine. One gets ripped off or one is missing. But the other thing is, is this caudal peduncle area. So this is a lot thinner than the Brooks stickleback. And it's also a lot less common in Alberta. And this is the great part about the ID feature that if you're looking, so it's really Northern or in the cold lake region because it's in the Beaver River Churchill drainage basin. So that's kind of a neat feature when you, when you think, oh, do I have a nine spine or a Brooks stickleback? But I have this handy dandy little photos that I try to put together. So you can see the Brooks stickleback, that caudal peduncle is a lot thicker compared to that little bit of a thinner caudal peduncle on the nine spine. And then we got the four to seven, very common, but then we have the eight to 11 on the nine spine, called above the other, and they're not in basically that distribution area that uh, Brooks Stickleback are. Okay, these ones, so what I like to do is differentiate Ciprinidae, so that's basically the minnow family. There's large body minnows versus small body minnows. And just to note that you can see my hand here. So this is the flathead chub, and this is a, probably an average size one and they actually get a lot bigger than that and they're found in um, the red deer river system also up in uh, the athabasca river and down here we have this northern pike minnow which is actually kind of hilarious because i'm not sure why it was called northern pike minnow and it, it doesn't have any teeth so it's uh <laughs> it's an interesting one but you can see here they get actually quite big um but I didn't want to talk too much about them because I really wanted to highlight Prussian carp. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about them lately and they're just honestly fabulous, terrible fish all in one. Um, they basically look like a goldfish. So if you do capture them, it's, it's really hard to tell the wild version of the goldfish versus the Prussian carp. A lot of the times you'll have to take them in for samples, but if you do catch anything similar to this, we do want uh, people to report it. Um, <laughs> basically terrible, invasive, and adaptable fish. And what I mean by adaptable is they could spawn three times a year using the milt of other fish, and it's called gyanocysis. And it's absolutely fascinating because they're not using the sperm of the other fish as a genetic material, but they're just using it to fertilize their eggs. So it just makes them almost um, so adaptable that you can take over all these systems and so I think I even have to update my maps. I think they're starting to come into, uh, potentially into the North Saskatchewan River and they're slowly moving north. They're all over Saskatchewan. It's just, it's a terrible, terrible fish. And some of the literature that I read was um, potentially they came over from Europe and somebody wanted to fish for them and they just dumped them in the ponds and they're more of a warm water fish species, but they basically uproot all the vegetation to eat. So they could go anywhere that there's vegetation and it's just, they can destroy ecosystems and it's uh, it's a pretty terrible fish, but again, they're, they're super adaptable. So if you do find them, there's not really too many that are similar to this, especially in Alberta. So um, I just uh, put the number up here and report them immediately to the toll-free hotline. The area fisheries biologist, um, Alberta Environment and Parks would like to know, even report it to me and I can help you out to get to the right place because they're pretty, pretty terrible fish. Okay, so here's the fun part. This is what I like. I like the small body minnows and trying to figure out what they are and where do they live and how do they, how do they go about their days. Um, this one here, so we're going to talk about the dorsal origin and pelvic origin, as I alluded to before. Um, a few other things, we may be looking at uh, the caudal peduncle area here and the end of the caudal peduncle here. We'll be looking at their head. Sometimes the scales will be crowded in here, and this will be your pre-dorsal scale, so we'll look at that. Sometimes we'll look for a line along the body here. And one thing I forgot to mention, if anybody has any questions and you want to just jump in and unmute yourself, go ahead. Um, we'll have some time at the end too, but if there's something you immediately need, um, just let me know. Okay, so this one's a fun one. So fathead minnows are very funny because they're best known for their sexual dimorphism. 
And as you can see here, the males actually have a black head and these little funny kind of horny tubercles as you see here. This is only when they're spawning and they're spawning usually in the spring from you know, about May till July, usually like a lot of warm weather. And these little spongy pads are actually on the males used to nudge the females to say, hey, look, you know what, I'm ready to go. Let's go spawn together. But they also have another interesting factor because they're really soft and they use these little horny tubercles to clean the nest. So they're very similar to um, the brook stickleback that take care of the nest and the females go off and do their own thing, which is really quite funny. Um, some of the key features what we're looking for here is the first fin ray is in half. That one I always love to put them in a little container so their dorsal fin is up and usually it's very distinct depending on which fish you're looking at, the spawning male. Um, this is a really good uh, feature when I used to identify them and I wouldn't be able to see their fins. And a lot of the times they would just come off the board and I would lose them and I just basically call them a grass fish after that. <laughs> so it, it's really handy to have them in this little aquarium here. Um, yeah, so what else do we have? So we have a line on the caudal peduncle here and this is on the fathead minnow. So when you're looking at other minnows, this is the one that'll have it. It'll be all the way down. These scales here are a little bit crowded compared to other ones. And we're gonna look for this line down the body. And a lot of the times they have this really blunt head. So if you're not catching them in the spawning season, this is what the female look like and this is what the male look like year round. But you still have that line on the caudal peduncle. Sometimes you'll have hash marks here, um, found throughout Alberta. And here's a few more characteristics. So this is a lot of the time when I was uh, out sampling, this is what I would see. So when you're looking at them, it's really neat because it's quite obvious here that we're going to look for that little line. So then I know that's the first thing I'll actually look for if uh, I do catch a fish that has a little bit smaller scales. Heads more blunt. We got some hash marks along the body here. So hash marks just a little bit of lines here and sometimes they'll make an X. And that first dorsal fin ray is cut in half. It's usually pretty obvious on fathead minnows, which is really makes it a really good ID feature on that one. Okay, has anybody ever caught an emerald shiner on the fly? Um, my buddy Paul Harper down south, he was out fishing at night, so he used a really tiny, mm, I can't remember, I think it was an 18, size 18 hook and was catching them on the fly. I thought, okay, so that's that's my goal. I'm gonna go do some micro fishing and uh, catch one of these guys. But the shiners of the world, typically they're in most of the major river systems. As you can see, they're kind of missing in certain drainage areas. I've got the feeling they're probably in that red deer drainage area, but I couldn't verify a lot of the information because I just don't have a lot of information to go on with these ones. Um, but they're great bait fish for walleye species. So a lot of the times you'll find them in the North Saskatchewan. These ones, you could tell they're a little bit different looking than say the fat minnow. They're quite shiny, aerodynamic body. This clear kind of at the end here it's not as noticeable here but you can actually see their insides which is neat and when they say emerald shiner a lot of times i avoid color because you don't see them very much the green aspect in them these fish were caught down south during the trend unlimited fish rescue you can see they're not really you don't really see that emerald part of them but sometimes in the lakes you might see them too um, you can see here we could see a little bit of their intestines and their everything so that's really neat but also I'm looking for too is that dorsal fin origin as you can see here this is actually a good photo here if you scroll up sorry that dorsal origin compared to the pelvic origin is really far back so you can see it really nicely in the containers but it's really super hard to see here so I'm just basically guesstimating where it's lining up in here so that's a really good feature to have and a lot of times if you catch one Emerald Shiner, there's going to be a ton more. They're kind of those French fries of the aquatic world. The other thing we're going to look for in these ones too is they won't have a spot on their caudal peduncle just in the bottom here. And oh my goodness, my cat's trying to follow the mouse. It's kind of hilarious. <laughs> so we don't have a spot at the caudal peduncle right here. It's fairly, they don't have too many lines along their body, but a lot of the times that translucent part, very large scales is my kind of first key feature that I've actually caught a Shiner. But then we're going to compare it to the river shiner and 
I sometimes don't want to say this out loud, but I've classified them wrong a few different times and hence why I think I got more into trying to understand the bait fish and the small body fish because I always thought they were emerald shiners, spot tails and a few others. So I was quite shocked when we caught this the one day thinking it just looks different. I don't know, it looks different. And so I pulled out my key and found out origin of the dorsal fin is parallel or in front. As you can see here, it's quite the distinction. It's quite a bit in front. The body just looks different. It's fatter, it's more, it's a deeper body. It's not translucent on the body here. Still doesn't have that spot. So I thought, huh, what is this? And uh, we keyed it out and I also sent it into the Royal Alberta Museum for um, identification feature and they confirmed uh, we got it right that it was a uh, river shiner. So, that was kind of neat and that was really late in the game too. So it's really easy to misidentify some of these fish because um, they're just, they're sometimes not easy and there's a lot of them, right? And what I usually say to people is if you're not sure and you're looking at it and you can't figure it out, it's okay to call it an unknown because sometimes I don't get too much into the hybrids, but I found a lake chub and a long nose nace hybrid a couple of years ago at the Chartered Unlimited Fish Rescue and basically threw my hands up in there and thought, oh my goodness, this just gets so complicated. And a lot of the time I'll have to take a step back and just, you know what, you look at those field features, you do the best you can. And uh, worst case scenario, you can bring the samples in for genetic verification, which is kind of neat, but uh, yeah, a lot of times we'll just look at um, the distribution, where they're at, major rivers, compared to, uh, let's see if we can go back. Ah, perfect. Emerald China are kind of all over the place, but again, the major rivers, but they do go up into northern Alberta. But a river shiner, there has been no records of going northern locations, but it doesn't mean they're not there. So. I always say, if you if you get something, you it just doesn't look right, take a picture of it, submit it, and uh, yeah, we could send it into the area of bios. I could take a look. Really nice, if it is in an actual container, then you could see those dorsal origin, because that's the first thing I'll look at versus a lot of other things, so yeah. Okay, one of my other favorites is the spot tail shiner. These are ones that if you're at the lake and you see a school of fish under the dock and I'm gonna set a minnow trap and put the, put the minnow trap in there and put a bunch of cat food, I'm gonna catch a bunch of these guys. Well, these ones are kind of really smart and really neat. So they school together because they have that spot on the caudal peduncle. And what that does is confuse predators because they think it's their eyeball. So a lot of times predators will go after just a bit of their tail caudal fin. And if they clip a little bit of their caudal fin, it's totally okay versus going after their eye where basically if they go head first, that's there. They're pretty much French fries again. <laughs> um, and the other thing I'm looking for is with these ones, origin is parallel in front. So it's similar to the river shiner, but it just has more of an aerodynamic body. So it's a little bit more um, reference to, I would say, the Emerald Shiner. Sometimes they get super fat. As you can see here, this one was almost 12 centimeters and I caught it in Saskatchewan and I was very shocked. I don't think I've ever caught one that big before, but it's that spot on the caudal peduncle is the first thing I'm going to look for. And then I'm going to look for that really massive eye. This one seems to have a way bigger eye than uh, most of the other species too. And a lot of the times I don't find them so much in um, the rivers but I find them more in the lakes and so they do like to uh, school in the shallows but I think if you put on a really small fly you might be able to catch them so that would be kind of neat that might be my next goal of microfishing um, that's one thing I've got into a lot too so if anybody wants to go microfishing it is a lot of fun <laughs> Uh, next one we got is Lake Chub. This one's really fun too because this one actually has a little bit of color, what I call pink in the pits. So I always tell the kids like look for the pink in the pits and sometimes you'll find pink by their operculum here and just behind their gill cover. Um, a lot of times with these ones, they just don't have as big as the scales as you can see in the shiners and they don't have that aerodynamic body. So those are the things I'll try to look at but they're also basically distributed all over Alberta. Some of the key features of this guy, they don't have that spot. There's no black spot at the end by the caudal peduncle there. First fin ray is full. So you can see here, this is a really good 
picture of it right here. Um, sometimes it's a little bit deceiving because you can see this one is actually, it looks like it's in half, but it's actually growing into, this is like one of their first one growing in, but it's not distinctly cut in half as that fat headed minnow one is. The other thing is they don't have that vertical line on the caudal peduncle. A lot of the times the dorsal origin is just parallel or slightly behind. It's not significantly behind. And then if you get, uh, if you get a really big one, what I try to do is there's usually a little tiny, it's a little tiny barbell in the corner of the mouth and it's super small, super hard to see until you start putting them in the containers and they start opening their mouth. So that's one little feature that I like to look at when I'm looking at these guys. Um, my goal is to catch one of these on the flies because they are surface feeders as well. They like to feed at night. So that's probably the best time. Same with um, Emerald Shiner. So um, these guys get eaten by pretty much everything. I know pike will eat them while I trout if they're within the vicinity too. So um, they do like to be in schools as well. They're not as schooling as much as the spot tail shiner, but they do like to hang out together. Okay, then if we look, this one's very similar. So this one's a pearl dace, basically distributed again all over Alberta. And this is the two that really, I found a hard time trying to identify because they were so similar. And a lot of people said, ah, Shauna, it's a lake chub pearl dace. Does, does it really matter? Well, I, I really do think it does because when they're spawning, they get this beautiful color along the males. And I just got so excited one day. And I think this is back in, 2008 and I said oh my goodness I think I caught a pearl day so this is the best thing ever and the person looked at me like really I, what, what does that mean and I said look at the males actually get this red spawning band and then the other things I'm looking at is the origin or the dorsal fin is behind so you can see here it's very well behind but there's also the hybridization part it makes it a little bit more confusing but the other thing I'm going to look for in pearl days, typically their mouth is fairly small, goes up to about the front of their eye here, usually that big eye. But you can see here, it doesn't have that silver coloration. This male too is just coming out of spawning colors and spawning is usually in the springtime. But a lot of the times we're looking for that really dark line along the body. And some people have said, oh, well, could you get it confused with other daces? Not necessarily because the scales are just looks more like a lake chub and I'll have a comparison slide that uh, we could talk about uh, a little bit later on here. But that single dark line will actually be one of the key features. But with a lake chub, they might have it as well. So we have to be really careful about that. Ooh, and that was one of my favorite pictures. So there's a story to this one. I lost the biggest um, trophy rainbow trout in my life. I was in my belly boat on the fly. It was Duck Mountain in uh, kind of northern Manitoba. It's uh, a park that boundaries Saskatchewan and Manitoba. I was told there was 25 pound rainbow trout there. So I targeted this rainbow. Somebody was angling and I thought, okay, I, I think I know what fly to use. Uh, so I just picked one. I thought, okay, it was getting late at night. The sun was just about to set. I get out in my little belly boat and the wind's pushing me out and thinking, oh, this lake is too big to get out in my belly boat. First cast, I, I land this, it, I, I'm pretty sure it was about a 20 pound rainbow. And I had my eight, nine weight almost bent right at the reel. And I thought, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so I brought it right up to my belly boat. I did everything that I could have done wrong because I couldn't figure out how to get my net because it was too big for my net. I grabbed the line and the line snapped. It was just, oh, I almost started crying. So of course, everybody saw this. And so I, I sulked away and thought, okay, fine. I'm going to go to this other lake because there is, I think about eight or 10 different lakes in the area. And so I proceeded to catch this lovely little pearl day. So I felt a little bit um, that I won at the end of the day, <laughs> but I put on a really small kind of like chronomen looking and, I was just super happy I caught something at that point. So I thought that was a really good story to share with everybody. <laughs> uh, so what I also like to do is have a lake chub, um, oops, lake chub, pearl dace, and fathead minnow. And I want to give kudos to my friend Holly for this one because it was, we were talking when she was in the field one day doing a fish rescue. 
and can you put them all together? I'm not sure what, how they, how they all fit in together. So I thought, actually, that's a great idea. And it just goes to show how similar they are, yet they're very different. Um, and I really emphasize having that dorsal origin and understanding of that and having them in a container so you can see their fins up. So I thought that's a really good comparison slide. Then we're going to get into uh, what I like to call these ones. These are fine scale days. And if you think back to when I had that original key, we talked about you can barely see any scales. That's one thing I'm going to look for too. So there are barely any scales. There is this weird line here. So, mm -hmm, but there's no fin ray in half. And also too, we're looking at that dorsal origin is pretty much behind the pelvic origin. This one has a little bit larger mouth than the eye. So this is our fine scale dace, which these ones are neat too, because fine scale dace, depending on if you want to, or if, if, you're, if you're sampling and you're working, you could put on your fish research license that I want to see what the intestines look like. Because these ones are really neat. They actually eat um, insects and plant material, a little bit of everything. So their um, digestive system isn't as coiled because they don't need to process as much because they're not plant eating species. Because um, I'll talk to talk a little bit about that next, but we're going to talk a little bit about distribution. Is they love beaver ponds, and it got me thinking as I was doing this presentation on how many times people don't respect beavers. And you know, I, I totally understand beavers can flood upstream parts of the channels; they get flood um, by houses. But when you go to drain a beaver pond, you really got to think of what fisheries are within that area. But then you also have to think about the wildlife aspect of it because there's the Wildlife Act. So you don't want to kill, harm, harass um, animals. So there's a lot more to it than just draining a beaver pond or trapping a beaver because it creates this mini little ecosystem that fish actually thoroughly enjoy and love because that beaver pond will give overwintering habitat. And that could be anywhere from two to 0 0.5 to two meters deep. And it provides great fish habitat. Um, I know some beaver impoundments in kind of the Kananasis area that have rainbow trout and brook trout and a whole bunch of different species. So it's not just the minnows that like those um, areas. And just thought I'd, uh, yeah, just thought I'd talk about a little bit about that. Um, the other thing about fine scale dace is they have this nice little band across, so similar to the pearl dace. But if we're going to compare them to another species, so we have long nose dace, these yeah. ones are really neat. I really like these ones because they basically sit in river systems. They really like the, the well dissolved oxygen systems, basically lots of flow. They like clean water. They're not going to be basically hanging out in those beaver ponds that maybe have a little bit less oxygen than um, the other places. And these ones too, they get a little bit of sexual dimorphism. They get a little bit of pink lipstick all throughout their body and maybe a little bit on their snout there, as you can see here in the adults. The juveniles are really kind of neat because they have this dark little mustache. So I say to the kids, you know what, look for that little mustache when you're doing a fish rescue. And these ones, they basically, they want to flip over the rocks so they could get to those mayflies and those stoneflies and they're going to be eating those aquatic insects as well too. Uh, a lot of late trout species will eat these as predators, so this might be a good one to think if you want to mimic any kind of bait fish, because the trout will definitely eat these guys up if they could get the get to get a hold of them. Okay, we're almost coming to a close. I'm so sad because I do love fish. It's really cool. Um, so just in essence, so this is the northern red belly day. So I wanted to compare it to the fine scale days. As you can see here along this one, they have a little bit, they're not as noticeable here. It does have the dark band, but he also has another dark band here. And a lot of the times the male, so that's when they're gonna be spawning. So that's where they get the Northern red belly from, but they're only gonna have two bands. The mouth is gonna be a lot smaller, but with the Northern red belly, they eat a lot of plant materials. So their intestine is actually gonna be coiled a lot more. And I always thought that was kind of fascinating because I thought, I don't really want to kill these fish, but if you're desperate for another ID feature, it actually works fairly well because we had uh, sometimes a few different mortalities. But the key feature I like on these ones, they have a really small mouth, doesn't usually extend past the eye here. Dorsal fin is just slightly behind versus the, the fine scale is usually quite a bit behind. 
We got the one line here, the second line here. Not too much. There's a little bit of a distinct line, but not really. There's a bit of a spot, but we're not going to really look at that one. We're going to look more on, as you can see, those two lines. That's going to be some of the key features on these guys. And basically all throughout Alberta, but they really enjoy those beaver ponds. So it really goes to show those beaver ponds are just, they're just full of habitat. It's, it's really kind of neat. Okay, well, I just want to say thank you to my great audience. It went by way too fast, <laughs> but that's okay. If uh, anybody has any questions, um, let me know. And just thought I'd put up a few more. This one is really cool. I was fishing in Saskatchewan with a buddy of mine and I caught a creek chub on a fly and I must have tried 18 different flies before we caught this guy. So I was super happy. It took me about two hours to catch it because <laughs> I couldn't figure out what it wanted to eat. So it was one of my part of my, okay, I could do this. I could do this. <laughs> okay. So I'm not sure the best way to do this. Um, do you want me to stop sharing? Uh, sure, if you want. Um, that was actually quite fascinating. I was uh, surprised how much I learned about uh, minnows and uh, how I want to get out there and do some uh, micro fishing and, uh, <laughs> and actually try this out. I, I've caught uh, lake chub on a, on a fly before, uh, but uh, now I'm thinking this might be another uh, interesting little project. It uh, sounds pretty good. So that was very fascinating. I, I'll uh, start off with the first question, and if anybody else has a question, just feel free to unmute and, uh, and ask your question, and uh, we'll get answers to everything here tonight. Um, let's see, I had a couple things written down here. You, you mentioned uh, containers and aquariums. Could you, could you uh, describe what this aquarium looks like and, and uh, you know, where to get them? Sure. Uh, I don't think it's very complicated. Yeah, actually, it's just, I'm wondering, I'll share my screen again really quick. And on the last page here, this little aquarium, so I have one similar to this and basically it's just a little aquarium that's, it's not very big. It's maybe 15 centimeters long by about 10 centimeters deep. This one I got from the Royal Ontario Museum, but the other ones that you could get are from Dynamic Aqua. And what I could do is uh, I could find the website and put it in the chat link here. And I think I paid maybe $40 for one and it's basically just plexiglass and most of them will have a little ruler in there. And it's just an easy way to put the fish in and then that way they basically are underwater. So you can take a bunch of pictures. You don't have to worry about them not being able to breathe. And it's just a really great way to see the fish as well too. So um, they do make bigger sizes. Um, I wonder if I, should, if I could go back to. You. So this bigger size, oh, oops. I'm gonna share one more time here. These bigger sizes ones, there's a lot of different places you could get them. I think I got one at the Nature Conservancy. This one I got at the Royal Ontario Museum too. And you can see this fish was massive. We caught this fish. Um, part of the Tread Unlimited Fish Rescue down south uh, just recently back on Thanksgiving weekend. And it's just, it's such a great way to kind of keep the fish just underwater. Cause I, I, I love to take pictures and then I started realizing, oh, I don't want to keep them out of the water. I want to try to keep them wet, right? So um, I'll look into Royal Ontario Museum if they still sell them, but it's Dynamic Aqua and I'll find, uh, I'll find that web website link for you. And uh, yeah, so if you are micro fishing, uh, Ken, the Fort Saskatchewan pond. Somebody put a bunch of perch in there, which ugh, terrible. But I was, I was, I caught a little perch about that big the other day, so that was kind of fun. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I got one, Shona, for you, it's Peter. Hi, Peter. <laughs> and thanks again for your comments about the signs. Much appreciated. Um, one of the, um, maybe it's something I'll regret, regret, but one of the things we offered to other TUC chapters is to modify some of that what trout eat for other provinces, specifically uh, BC, Saskatchewan. Um, if we're talking, for example, Saskatchewan, what would be the two commonest uh, small bodied fish? you would think that people were gonna find in lakes there? 
Oh my goodness. That's a great question. Um, I've sampled only a few times because I was so scared of ticks and getting covered in ticks that uh, I didn't sample too much, but Saskatchewan is very similar to Alberta, but the best part about Saskatchewan is they have a lot of the darter species. So they have Johnny darter, um, black sided darter, Iowa darter, lots of different, um, the emerald shiner, there was sand shiner, um, spot tail shiner, spot tail shiner, those really big ones. So very similar to what we have here. I actually mm -hmm. found it a, quite a bit of a struggle to find something different. Um, when I did find a sand shiner, I actually sent it into the biologists in Saskatchewan to confirm. And so I caught those at, it was Buffalo Pound Lake. And it's a super long lake. I think it's about 20 or 30 kilometers, maybe even more. Um, but that's where I caught them there. And it's a really shallow lake. So pretty much similar minnow species, maybe not as many pearl dates, but the darters are a lot more significant there, which is really neat. Okay, and would, would there be um, uh, fat head minnows and brook stickleback in, in, in the same type of population we find in Alberta? Yes, and there's actually a little bit bigger of a population because it's so warm down south. Okay. When you get up into northern Saskatchewan, it's similar to our climate, but down south, it's the population of fish down there. They're just, they're exuberant. They, they have carp, they have, I'm trying to think of, Cisco. I must have caught 50 Cisco in less than 10 minutes when I was ice fishing down on Catepoa Lake. So because it's so eutrophic and there's so many things that are going in from a lot of the different fertilizers and just the heat, the, the fish species just, they grow ugh, gigantic there. A, a 10 pound, 15 pound pike was quite normal ice fishing down there. And I thought, I don't know if I've ever saw that really too much in Alberta. <laughs> But the other good thing is too that their fisheries ratio, fishermen ratio there versus lakes is a lot lower than Alberta. So Alberta has a lot higher angling pressure than Saskatchewan. So I would highly recommend fishing in Saskatchewan if uh, if you want to look at walleye, cisco, um, northern pike. Um, there, there's some pretty amazing species there. Even carp. I caught a 27 inch carp just in Regina. Uh, on Muscana Creek, so it's pretty pretty crazy down there. <laughs> okay, thanks. Stefan, you have a question? Go ahead and unmute. Oh yeah, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, Shona, I just wanted to ask you about um, uh, keys specifically. Uh, I've been looking for a while for a comprehensive key. Uh, I'll preface that by saying I own all your books already. Um, a comprehensive key to fishes of Alberta, but also specifically cyprinids of Alberta, and maybe even going into BC a little bit, hopefully, but having a really tough time finding some, some uh, good literature keys. That's a great question. So this is the book I used, um, the Nelson and Pates, when I was basically learning my fish ID. This is yeah, a really good one. I could get you the one. link to that. Um, the other one I would suggest, but the problem is it's super old. It's the Scott and Crossman, Freshwater Fishes of Canada. The, yeah. the good thing about this one is Dr. Nicholas Mandrake with Royal Ontario Museum is updating it to the most newest version. But when I spoke with him last, it was probably last year, he said, the problem is Suprinids is there's not enough money to really put a lot of effort and research into them because people just honestly don't care about them. There, There's a lot of other different focuses on it. Um, but that being said, I know DFO, when I was back, I think at the Canadian Conference for Fisheries Research, it was, oh, I can't remember, Martin Coops he was doing a call out that DFO wants to understand a lot more about the Supernid species. So hopefully in the next, I'd say five to 10 years, we get a little bit more understanding on how important the, the ecosystem is, because if we move, if we lose all the Supernids, we're, we're going to be in trouble. But the problem is it's how do we identify them correctly just even to start at that level, but right. with more, with more education coming up, but keep an eye on this one. Um, okay, freshwater be, pieces of Canada. I don't have that one. Yeah, this is Scott and Crossman, and I think I might have the PDF 
copy of those. The other good one is is Doug Watkinson. I worked with him for a little bit and he decided um, he was fantastic enough to share some um, of his photos with me. So he's got some really good keys in here as well too. And I'll just give you a little bit of a sample here. So he did really well on uh, doing the, the Sopranos in Manitoba. Um, he's a really good resource. And this one's at the University of Manitoba, if I remember correctly. So awesome. And, Thank you. Yeah. And the other one, I'm kind of a fish book nerd, as you could tell, <laughs> is this guy here. It's the Royal Ontario Museum Fisheries book. We've got uh, got all the fishes from Ontario. So that's another good key resource. And the good thing is about this is with all these resources, I try to compile them into one and everybody has a different way of identifying. And I find sometimes it's just going in the field and you find a completely different characteristic you never even thought of. And it's like, oh, actually, if you go this way instead of this way, this way, that'll help too. Um, right on. Yeah. Could I and, ask you another question to add to that? Sure can. Which, which one would be the best to cross-reference uh, for Cyprinids in, in British Columbia? Because it doesn't seem like there's one for there. There is McPhail. So I'm trying to think. I have a PDF copy of it. I could actually, if you want to, here, I'll put my email in the chat. Sorry, I know this to... is Alberta. but <laughs> No, this is, this is all good. That's the hard part I'm finding as well, too. Um, I think it's McPhail. He has a BC fish ID key, but there's absolutely no pictures. Um, and I don't know if there's really much on Saprinids at all. So that's kind of where I thought, hmm, maybe I'll do that yeah. over the winter. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's great questions because I still I still struggle a lot of times when I'm in the field and just sometimes you just can't figure it out. And the next point is if like you can't figure it out, I've talked to the people at Royal Alberta Museum, the Royal Ontario Museum, they're more than willing to take samples to help you get to that confidence on what your supreme is. So that's another option too. And you just have to uh, connect with the, the ichthyology departments and they're really good that way. Um, awesome. when, it comes to, Thank you. when it comes to BC too, there's a lot of really good BC fisheries biologists that I'm trying to connect with too. So I'll, uh, I'll let you know. Sweet. Thank you. You're welcome. Shauna, where can people find your book? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. So I'm going to put my website in the chat for everybody. Um, uh, and I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Holly because she started my website as a Christmas gift to me. And that was that was pretty amazing. Um, but when it comes to my book, I'm going to try to print some here in the next couple of weeks. So if anybody wants uh, to order a copy for Christmas coming up for those great fishermen out there, I'm going to put an order in probably in the next week or so. And then I usually order every couple months or when there's um, when there's there's need for it. And usually I have a few extras. So just let me know and I don't mind putting in some orders. So it'll take about a week to get the order and then I could come drop it off or you could come get it at my place or I could do shipping as well too, so. Besides the uh, micro fishing, the angling, what are, what are some tips for catching minnows or, or small fish? Ooh, that's that's a great question. A lot of the time when I focus on catching them, it's usually the time of year. And a lot of the time of year is in the springtime. And when they're spawning, they're actually super easy to catch. And I try not to harass them too much, but usually kind of May to June is really good. Uh, fathead minnows, you just throw a minnow trap down and sometimes they're just bursting out of the seams to get in there. Uh, you could do dip netting. I was out with my friend Lila that I see on the screen here and we're dip netting. We caught some young of the year northern pike and it was just dip netting in the shallows in uh, the weed beds and stuff and just dip netting really quickly. Um, Minute trap, I think, is the best way. But if you're going to use minnow traps, I would suggest using the silver ones that you can find at the minnow, or sorry, at the fishing hole. And they have a silver band on the top, and they're silver throughout. For some reason, the silver galvanized ones work so much better. Use some kind of cheese product, popcorn, cat food. Um, what else? The ham works well. Um, the seafood, cat food works really well for. But basically, I would say from 
maybe even beginning of May, like right when the ice comes off, like about beginning of May till about July, August is the best time. Usually it really tapers off when they get into the, start going into their kind of overwintering habitat in September, October. So not the best time, but usually throughout the summer, it's pretty good. And you just want to find areas that a lot of vegetation, a lot of cover and areas that they can just hide under. So they're, they're away from predators. A lot of times I'll set a metal trap right under a log and leave it for about 24 hours if I can, because you should check them at least every 24 hours. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions from the group? Well, that was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much, Shauna. I learned uh, quite a few things and uh, I've got a few things on my inspiration list here now too. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I think it's a great group of people and uh, really enjoy coming here. So thank you so much.